Human beings are creatures of habit. And we have a tendency to get into routines, whether it's routines at work, routines at school, routines at home. And these routines actually serve a good purpose, gives us order in our lives, helps us to maintain and keep on track what we're supposed to be doing. But sometimes when we kind of, because of routine, sometimes the temptation is there or the tendency is there because we've done the same thing the same way every day, sometimes maybe we just don't really think about what we're doing anymore. We go through the motions, we go through the routine, we kind of check off our checklists of the things that we're supposed to be doing, and then we move along without putting a lot of thought into it. Now, there are times in secular life that maybe those things can be done, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But Neil's lesson on Wednesday got me to thinking, uh, as he was speaking about making sure we pray to God, making sure we study our Bible, making sure we don't get kind of caught up in this, this rut as, as Christians, that we make sure we're focused on doing what God wants us to do. That sometimes as Christians, because we do the same things week by week, on the Lord's Day we gather together, we sing hymns, we take the Lord's Supper, we give of our means, we... Uh, study God's Word. On Wednesday, we come together, we have Bible study. Uh, Sunday mornings, we have Bible study as well. We do this every week. And the problem that sometimes we run into is because we are creatures that tend to uh, routine and to habit, sometimes we get into this process of doing the same things over and over again without putting thought into it. And I want you to consider this morning the fact that God wants us to give our best no matter how often we do something. Consider what the psalmist says in Psalm 37 and in verse 23. David says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. And going down to verse 30 the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. The law of, God, law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Now, I want you to consider the mind of the righteous man that David describes here. The fact that his steps are ordered by God. And the, the, the thought process or the awareness that needs to go in to an individual, making sure that their steps go according to what God wants it to be. That there's consideration. That there's pre-consideration. Not just something I think of at the last second, but something I've planned. I've ordered in my mind. Well, just as actions need to be planned, our thoughts going into those actions need to be planned as well. To make sure we premeditatedly, when we pray to God, our thoughts and our mind are in a, a space to speak to God with our full thought, our full commitment. That when we study God's word, we're not just reading the words on the page, but we're actually considering what those words mean, what the context is, how it can apply to us. Because what we want to consider, what we want to remind ourselves, this is not new, what we want to remind ourselves about this morning is that God desires sincere obedience. He doesn't just want from his people to take out a checklist and have the hymns on there, check. Lord's Supper on there, check. Contribution, check. And as long as I've done the things, as long as I've gone through the motions, that's good enough. Because that's not even what God wanted in the Old Testament, much less in the New Testament. In 1 Samuel chapter 15... And in verse 19, we have, after Saul was commanded to destroy all of the Amalekites, Samuel comes along because Saul didn't destroy all the Amalekites. And he asks Saul, Samuel does in verse 19, Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul, in verse 20, defends himself. He says, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone out on the mission on which the Lord sent me, and I've brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. The commandment of the Lord, however, 
the specifics of the commandment of the Lord was to destroy everything. The livestock, the king. Well, the king, he's taken back. He's kept him alive. And in verse 21, the people took the plunder, the sheep and the oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. I think it's interesting that he says your God, not my God. So Samuel said in verse 22, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. And as he goes on to say in verse 23, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. Saul had convinced himself he'd done what he was supposed to do. He checked his checklist. God says, destroy everybody. I'm close enough. As far as he was concerned, the details of the commandment weren't really that big of the, the deal. He, for all intents and purposes, destroyed the people of the Amalekites, never mind the king. And, well, the, the rest of the livestock and all the, the animals, we killed the worst of them, but the best, the people, decided to offer to God. And so when Samuel says in verse 22, has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what he tells you to do? Not that God didn't command burnt offerings and sacrifices, but God wants you to consider what he says and take thought to what you do when you do it. Because if Saul had really considered what God's word was, if Saul had taken the time to think, Maybe Saul would have paid attention to the details. But you see, what happens when we get into a routine, what happens when we get into a habit of doing something over and over again, sometimes the details get forgotten. The details get missed or glossed over. Because it's the same thing every day, or in our case, sometimes the same thing, same thing every week. And it's important that we pay attention to the details of what God wants because in offering the details, God encourages us to pay attention. Saul did not pay attention. Instead, Saul says, well, this will be good. This is, this, is, this is pretty much close enough. I pretty much did what God wanted me to do. And it speaks to where Saul's mind is. In Deuteronomy chapter 16 and in verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16 and in verse 16. This day the Lord your God commands you. To observe these statutes and these judgments. Here's the law. Therefore you shall be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. Even under the Old Testament, sometimes people are under the mis, or kind of under the misunderstanding or this idea that under the Old Testament you didn't have to really think about what you did. As long as you offered your sacrifices, as long as you paid your tithes, as long as you did what you were supposed to do, that was good enough. What's interesting is it's true that we see example of that from the people of Israel, even into the New Testament, from some of the Pharisees kind of going through the motions, doing the works, so to speak, but not with the heart and the soul. You see, God has always expected of his people not only to just do what he says and just kind of go through the motions. He has always commanded his people to do what he says and pay attention. And to do it with your heart and your soul. Notice he tells them to be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse 17, today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God. But you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments and his judgments, that you will obey his voice. Also today, the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people, just as he promised you that you should keep all his commandments. <clears throat> we are to be a special people, just as Israel was supposed to be a special people. But again, not just the type of people who, okay, here's what the checklist is that our God wants and as long as we do that, he'll be happy. He wants us to be careful to use our heart and our soul in what we do. In fact, in the giving of the Ten Commandments, in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5, notice part of what he encourages. We see it there also in Deuteronomy 26. But here in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 7, 
God offers the commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Verse 8, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 9, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. It's not just I show mercy to those who just go through the motions and check the checklist. It's not just mercy to those who keep my commandments, who love me and keep my commandments. As we noted back in Deuteronomy 26, yeah, there's that same concept there that we should be careful to observe with all our heart and all our soul. But notice what comes first here. If, if you love me, you'll, you're going to do what I tell you to do. This is what I want from you. Not just that you do what I tell you to do, but that you love me and do what I tell you to do. And that speaks to part of what our motivation should be. When we are preparing to worship God, when we're preparing to sing hymns, to offer up prayers, to take the Lord's Supper, to offer our contribution, to proclaim God's word or to listen to God's word, part of our motivation to be focused on those things needs to be that I love God and I love Jesus and I love the Holy Spirit and I love the plan of salvation that they, they have laid out for me. I love being able to worship him. Jesus says the exact same thing that God commands in Deuteronomy, but in the New Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter, or I'm sorry, John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It doesn't get any more complicated than that. If you love me, you'll do what I tell you to do. The same thing God commanded in Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy 10 as well. In 1 John chapter 5 and in verse 2, John reminds the saints, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Not only here's how I know I'm serving Him the way I should be when I love Him and keep His commandments, but here's how I know also that I love my brethren when I love God and keep His commandments. Verse 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments aren't burdensome. God has not put us in a position to fail. He's put us in a position to be able to do what he tells us to do. No commandment that he has told us to do is impossible. And he sent his son to prove that it's not impossible. Nothing that he's asked us to do will automatically contradict or cause us to disobey another commandment that he's given us. Everything's in harmony with itself, the word that he's given us. But notice the emphasis over and over. If we love the children of God, how do we know we love the children of God? We love God and keep his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, we have a whole bunch of, of hymns in our psalm book that are based on or inspired by Psalm 119. But I want you to note a couple of verses from this very, very long psalm. Notice Psalm 119, verse 45. The psalmist says, I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Notice the, the terms that he uses here. I seek your precepts. I'm not ashamed of your testimonies. I delight in your commandments. I love your commandments. I meditate on your statutes. This is someone who has committed themselves not only to loving God, but to loving the word that God gave us. And that, at that point, the Old Testament. For us, the Old Testament certainly is a part of that, but the New Testament in Christ Jesus. 
He goes on to say in the 127th verse, Psalm 119 and verse 127, Therefore I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. Therefore all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. I hate every false way. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. Notice the mind of this individual, the fact that they compare them, first of all, to perhaps the most precious physical thing, physical possession that most people can, can have, which is gold. Since ancient times, gold has been rare and valuable, and as it is today. And yet more than gold, he says, does he love his commandments? Your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right, I hate every false way. Your testimonies are wonderful. Verse 30, or 130, 130. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Notice verse 131. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. We have a hymn, As the Deer which is also based on another hymn, as the deer pants for the water, so I long after you. Well, here that same imagery is used, but with regard to God's word. Unfortunately for some people, even in the religious world, people who consider themselves Christians, their Bibles, they're really more like a drink tray or a food tray or something for them to set stuff on top of during the week. And it may be something they pick up only when they go to church. But the psalmist helps us to realize that in loving God, we also have to love and should love his word. That we value his word above all other things. That being the case. In James 1 and in verse 22... Going into the New Testament, James 1 and in verse 22, James, as he's describing someone who looks in the mirror then forgets who they are, he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James wants the brethren to listen and apply the things that he offers. And in warning, what he says is, be doers of the word. That same word that we're told we should love and value and cherish. And not just hearers only. Deceiving ourselves. Why? Well, what happens is sometimes when we hear God's word. And we say, yeah, those are, those are good points. Yeah, I, I should do that. Yeah, I really do see areas in my life that I should fix and change. And then I walk out those doors. And then guess what happens? Well, routine kicks back in. The same, going through the motions of the normal work week or school week, the same things, the pattern that we have established, our schedule that we've established, kicks back in. And it causes us sometimes to not remember those things that I wanted to change, that I wanted to fix. Areas of my life maybe I wanted to enhance or make better. Areas that I know I can do better at. All of a sudden, I get back into my routine. And if I have trained myself, if my routine, my habits are such that they are not maybe as good as what I want them to be regarding God and his word, then I'm going to fall right back into that spiritual rut that I was in before I heard whatever it was that I needed to apply. This is why sometimes New Year's resolutions are so difficult to resolve. Because we make these plans, we set up these goals for ourselves. By December 31st of next year, this is what I want to have done. This is where I want to be, whatever the case is. And then maybe for the first week or two or three, maybe we do pretty well. But then that habit kicks back in. Or that routine kicks back in and gradually we kind of just forget that my goal was this or that. Well, the exact same thing can happen when it comes to being stronger, 
being more faithful, adding good habits to our daily lives as Christians. And this is why it's so important to listen to what James says. Be doers of the word, not just hearing it and saying, oh yeah, that's a good idea, I need to do that, and then forgetting it after time. But making sure I have that goal in my mind. Neil, in his lesson on Wednesday, gave us some ideas on things that we can do in our day-to-day -day life to help us to be more focused on God. And I think that that is a, is a great way of going about trying to, to consider ideas on how I can be a stronger, more faithful servant to God and a stronger, more faithful servant to others. For instance, in prayer and in praise of God, we talk about praying often. Paul says, pray always. But sometimes, even with prayer, we get into a routine. Maybe we pray for our food. Maybe we pray in the morning and at bedtime. And that's great. But what happens is, sometimes we tend to say the same things over and over and over again. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with saying those things. But if our heart's not in it, if we're not thinking about what we're saying when we offer the prayer to God, then what's the point? We're saying the words, but just as when we sing hymns to God, God wants to hear our heart. We can thank God for our food. May it nourish us to the benefit of our body or whatever, however we tend to say it, and everybody kind of has their own way to say it. But if we're not actually thinking about it, if we're not considering the words, it doesn't really mean anything. And the same way with any other prayer, whether it's a, a morning prayer, an evening prayer, prayer before bed, whatever the case may be, taking thought to what I'm doing is just as important, I would say even more important, than praying often. I could pray often without any consideration to what I'm saying, and it just doesn't mean anything. Making sure I'm praying sincerely and from the heart is just as important. Being an example to others, we talk about this all the time. And for that reason, maybe it's important to, to think about what it means to be an example to others. Because a lot of times we say, be an example to others. Oh yeah, I need to be an example to other people. I get it. I understand. We've said this a million times. But then what happens? I go to work, I go to school, and routine kicks back in. Going through the motions kicks back in. But then what happens when I'm going through those motions, I'm going through that routine, but then there's an opportunity to be a good example to someone. But I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing. I'm not really paying attention because, again, I'm in my routine. And so I miss that opportunity. Maybe even I become an example for a hypocrite. Someone who says, this is what God wants us to do. And without even thinking about it, without even realizing what I'm doing, I've done something sinful or something wrong. And because, why? Because I wasn't really thinking about what I was doing. I was in my routine. It's the same thing I do every day, all day. It doesn't, it's not any different every, any day. But for that very reason, I get caught up in things maybe that I shouldn't be saying or shouldn't be doing or shouldn't be thinking. When I invite others to church, I need to invite others to church. It's fine. It's great. I should invite others to church, but I should do it because I care. Not just because, well, I can check my checklist off on my weekly goal or my daily goal to invite somebody to church today. I can feel good about myself because I invited somebody to church. It shouldn't be to check, a check, a check on the checklist. It should be because I care about other souls. People need to see Christ living in me. In Matthew 5, Jesus speaks about the light so shining before others. Having that positive influence on others. But guess what? You can't do that if your mind is stuck in a circle. If I'm stuck thinking in the same routine, the same thing over and over and over every day, and I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing, then you're going to miss those opportunities. I'm going to miss those, those opportunities to say something about maybe what God's word has to say. 
opportunities to be able to, to help somebody maybe when they're going through a trial of life. And I can offer maybe a verse that can encourage them to look deeper into what God's word has to say. This is why Paul tells the Ephesians in Ephesians 5 to walk circumspectly, redeeming the time. And I love that word, circumspect. Because the term carries with it being aware of myself in relation to the situations around me in a 360 degree arc. That's what the concept of circumspectly means. I'm aware of myself, I'm aware of the example I'm setting, and I'm aware of the opportunities that are available to me to be a good example, to let my light shine. The opposite of circumspect is blind, unaware. And if I get caught up in my routine day by day, week after week, the temptation is there to become blind. And I'm not paying attention anymore. I once heard an older preacher say that if you ever have to ask yourself what it means to be a good example to someone else, you know, sometimes we ask for blessings from God. We ask for help with this or help with that. We ask for assistance or encouragement. And then maybe somebody at worship tells you something. They say something. Maybe they have no idea what's going on, but they say something to you and it builds you up and it edifies you and it encourages you. And later on, you're thinking about it and you realize God answered your prayer. Maybe you didn't realize how he was going to do that, but he did it through someone else. Because they were being a good example to you. And this older preacher said, have you ever thought about being a good example means being a blessing to other people? That means being aware of what I say and what I do when I'm with others. The things that I say to uplift and edify, to encourage and not to tear down. The things that I do to help people to, to know that I care about them, that I love them, not to give them the impression that I don't like them or, or think about them. This is why the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 11 reminds the saints to consider one another, verse 24, in order to stir up love and good works. In essence, the Hebrew writer is telling the saints, be a blessing to one another. But that takes thought. It takes consideration. If I go through the same routine every Lord's Day or every time I'm here on Wednesday, I come in, I sit down in my pew, I go through class, I go through worship, but I don't take the time to think about how can I help sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so. What can I do to be a blessing? How can I encourage someone else? I'm not considering others in order to stir up love and good works. How can I be a blessing for other people? But then also, there's the aspect of making sure that we stay in contact with one another. Making sure that we are helpful to one another. And one of the best ways that we can help our brethren is to talk to each other and be willing to share what we're going through and be willing to help others we know are going through a difficult time. Some of us are shy. Some of us are introverts. Some of us have difficulty, maybe in crowds. All those things are understandable, but there's always something we can do. There's always a way we can reach out to those around us, our brethren specifically, to be able to encourage and edify. Reaching out to those maybe who have fallen away. Maybe there are some who haven't been at worship service in a couple of weeks. Looking in on them, checking in on them, seeing what's going on. Are they sick? What's happening? Showing forth our care. Because we all struggle. I guarantee you, 99% of the people in here right now at least, are struggling with something. I'd say 99% at least are struggling with something. We all struggle with issues of life. We all struggle with certain temptations, with weaknesses. But one of the ways in which we encourage and edify each other is by talking to one another and then accepting help from one another. And especially in our Western world, this isn't as true. I've heard from preachers who have been to the Philippines, have been to other places in the world where they are far more open 
with their personal struggles with each other. And these preachers come back and they say, it's eye-opening just how closed off we are to one another compared to other churches of Christ in the world. And I've really taken that to heart to, to remember that sometimes we're, we're, we don't want to maybe burden others with struggles that we're going through. Maybe we don't want people to look differently at us when they find out what we're going through. But ultimately, God has given us each other so that we can help one another get to heaven. We can't do it on our own. And no matter how strong we think we are or how proud we are, and we don't want to talk about the fact that I have weaknesses, guess what? It's not a secret. Everybody does. Being able to talk to one another and let brethren be a blessing for us. If I don't accept help from others, how can they be a blessing to me? How can I help them fulfill their commandment to be a blessing to me, to help me? In addition to that, maintaining perspective in this world is hardest to do when we're stuck in this constant loop, this constant routine of go to work, work, come home from work, go to school, do school stuff, and then come home from school over and over and over every day. Because what happens is we get so bogged down in the minutia and all the specifics of life. Not to say that those are unimportant. They are. They're important. But sometimes we lose the forest because of the trees. Sometimes we forget what the point is of our being here to start with. Paul tells the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 6 to put on the helmet of salvation. Well, there's a reason it's a helmet and it's going on your head. It's because salvation and a home in heaven needs to be at the forefront of our mind every day. And that's hard to do when maybe you're running late for work or late for school, or maybe I didn't get quite all of my questions done on my report or whatever. And so I get so focused in on what I'm doing and day by day, it's the same exact thing, but maybe it's only on Sundays or on Wednesday nights that I'm reminded, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Or, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be thinking about heaven. Or, oh yeah, this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. If those are the only times we're reminded of that, if it's the only times we think about that, what's happening over the other seven, six and a half days of life when I'm not thinking about it? The only way that we're going to get to heaven is if our goal every day is on heaven. Because Satan is sneaky. Temptation gets kind of thrown in there. And if we're caught up in our routine and in our same pattern every day, Satan's throwing darts at us constantly and we may never see him. Never notice. Remind yourself, this world is not your home. And don't let life get you down. Life wears us down. It does. That's just the way it is. And yet, at the same time, Paul tells the Galatians in Galatians chapter 6, do not grow weary in doing good. And the whole point of it that he ends up is, is if you persevere, we shall reap what we've sown. Do not grow weary while doing good. Physically, we get tired. We get worn out. Emotionally, we get tired, we get worn out. Mentally, we get tired and we worn out. Spiritually, we cannot get tired and worn out. And there's a reason why we're constantly called to renew our minds. Romans chapter 12, Paul calls on the brethren through the word of God, this renewal that we should have every day to remind ourselves of what we're supposed to be. Because it's about heaven. And as D. Bowman used to say, if you've missed heaven, you've missed it all. God's word in all of this and all of the different applications we've looked at is crucial in keeping us focused. Because we can remind ourselves to remind ourselves that this world is not our home. We can remind ourselves to remind ourselves to pray. But God's word 
brings us face to face with what God expects of us. And as Neil brought out in his exhortation Wednesday night, set a time within your schedule or within the, the routine. Plan time to be able to spend in God's word. Maybe it's not necessarily a topic and, and don't necessarily start with Genesis, although if that helps you, that's fine. But maybe especially to start with, focus on passages that remind you of what it means to be a Christian. Read Romans 12. Read James chapter 1 about temptation. Read Revelation 4 about the throne of God in heaven. Think about and focus on passages that are designed to inspire you and to help you to be the example you're supposed to be. When you're at work and you've got maybe a, a couple extra minutes at lunchtime before lunch ends, take your phone out or your tablet or your Bible, if you've got your physical Bible with you, and read some passages that will help you for the rest of the day. We talk about Wednesday nights <clears throat> being an opportunity to kind of recharge our batteries, to kind of refocus. Well, why not have a time at lunchtime to refocus yourself during the middle of the day? Maybe you start out in the morning, you're going strong, but then by lunchtime, a lot of people were starting to look at the clock. When is it time to go home? And yet, God's word will help us to remain focused on the fact that no matter what time it is or what's going on in the day, the boss is yelling at me, whatever, I'm still supposed to be a Christian. Make sure to put time in your day to focus on God's word because that will help us to put on and keep on that helmet of salvation. It will remind us to pray. It will remind us that we are motivated and should be motivated because we love God to do what he tells us to do. In John chapter 4, the final point for you this morning. In John chapter 4, Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman at the well. And as she is asking this question, she's finally gotten into this spiritual mindset. Jesus has had to kind of lead her there. She asks the question, okay, well, you know, you Jews say we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. My fathers say we're supposed to worship on this mountain. And there's kind of an implied question there. And Jesus answered, he told her the hour is coming when it won't matter where you are. But what he says in verse 24 is God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, worshiping in truth is focused on doing what God says because God said it. Not like Saul, who said he got close enough. I still I did the word of God. I, I didn't pay attention to the details, but I, I did it. No, we're focused on the truth, and that includes all the details. But the danger there, again, even in our worship service, is because we do the same things every Sunday, every Wednesday night. The danger is that, yeah, we're focused on the truth aspect. We're doing what God tells us to. But because we do it all the time, we may forget that we're supposed to be focused on why we're doing it. And that is part of what Jesus is talking about regarding worshiping according to the Spirit. For instance, when we pray as a congregation, when Joe led us in prayer just a little while ago, it's his voice speaking. But we are all in one accord following the thoughts that are being offered to God. We are praying the same prayer together and making sure that we're focused on those words to make sure that the things that are, we are saying that we're doing as a congregation collectively have meaning and are not just vain. Because if Joe's the only one up here and he's the only one praying, it's just Joe praying. It's not the congregation. And yet we're to all pray in one accord. Singing. And this is very important, especially given the, the harmonies and the notes that we have in our hymns. We have a lot of beautiful hymns in our psalm books. And we have hymns that have different parts. You've got soprano, you've got alto, you've got tenor, you've got bass. And singing those parts is very beautiful and it's very, it's very helpful and encouraging too sometimes. But the very first thing that we should focus on 
are the words. And it's important for us because sometimes, especially for those of us who may sing a particular part, like a bass or, or alto, sometimes we get focused on reading the notes right, make sure we're hitting the notes the way we're supposed to and the song's going the way it should, and we're forgetting what the words are in the hymn. And it should be the other way around. Because the audible harmony is not as important as the harmony of the heart. And that's what God wants to hear. He wants to hear our heart singing the words, not just the melody coming out of our voice. Focus on the words first, and then the notes second. When we take the Lord's Supper, which is and should be the pinnacle, the, the ultimate focus of our Lord's day, we are gathered together to partake of the Lord's Supper. When we do that, we're not just taking the bread and taking some grape juice. If we are, it has no meaning. We should be reminding ourselves that Jesus died for me. He was beaten. His back was torn off for me. His hands and his feet were nailed to a cross for me. His blood was shed for me. And sometimes, especially those of us when we're, when we're leading fellas in public, it's really difficult to be focused on what we're doing because we're so focused on making sure everybody gets served the way they should. But don't let yourself be distracted and forget. And usually, usually we take it at the back. Don't forget what you're doing. That you're taking the bread, you're taking the fruit of the vine, the body and the blood of the Lord. And sometimes for myself, especially if I'm having a hard time keeping my focus, for whatever reason, sometimes I say, I'll say a quick second prayer. When we lead a prayer as a congregation, then sometimes for myself, I'll say another. Just to have that extra time to focus on the bread or on the fruit of the vine. I know some people will read the scripture we'll have up on the board. Some people will open their Bible. Some people will read the hymn, the, the words of the hymn that we sung in preparation for the Lord's Supper. All of those are great ideas to help you focus and be, be remember on what you're doing and not be distracted. When we give of our means, sometimes we do it because we're commanded to do it. And we know that we ought to pay for bills that we have here in the congregation and so forth. But remember how often Paul, as he encouraged the Corinthians in chapter 8 and chapter 9, yeah, he says God loves a cheerful giver. But cheerful doesn't mean happy. And we've talked about the difference before between happy and joy. It means joyful. Having joy in knowing that I am assisting in the work of the Lord, not only with myself, my own time, my own effort, but with my own funds as well. There should be joy there. Just as the joy the Philippians had when they sent assistance to Paul. And they had wished to do it before, but they couldn't. And now they could. And Paul's saying, I'm happy that you're able to do this. Paul had joy that they were able to assist in that work. We should have joy. That knowledge of being blessed. That as we have been given from God blessings to us, we can be a blessing to the work. And we can help in that effort as well. And when we have Bible class, when we have lessons or sermons, when we pay attention to those things, no matter who it is that's leading the class, no matter what the topic is, to first of all make sure the truth is being taught, okay? That, that should be first and foremost. But then once we ascertain that the truth is being taught, that we make sure we're devoted to learning and applying it to ourselves, to living it in my life. Because my goal needs to be that I'm motivated to live faithfully as a Christian because I love the Father, I love the Son, and I love the Holy Spirit. That's part of my goals. My goal is to be zealous for good works, as Paul told Titus, in Titus chapter 2, that we are to be zealous for good works, his own special people. 
My goal is to have joy when I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Not just checking the checklist and say, okay, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. God, I'm sure God must be happy because I've done it all. I should have joy when I'm doing those things and I'm focused on doing them because I love God. And I love His Word. And I love what He tells me about Himself and about heaven and about His promises. And my goal needs to be that I always give Him my best. In Malachi chapter 1 and in verse 6, God speaks to His people and He's upset. He says, a son, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where's my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? Kind of like Saul. In what way have I not obeyed the commandment of God? I, I basically destroyed the Amalekites. Well, in what way have we despised your name? Verse 7, you, have, you offer defiled food on my altar. Well, we offer it. We basically do what we, told, we were told to do. You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying that the table of the Lord is contemptible. Verse 8, when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Verse 9, but now entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Verse 12, you profane it, in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, its food is contemptible, and you say, oh, what a weariness. Verse 13, you sneer at it says the Lord of hosts, and you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick, and thus you bring an offering. Well, God, we've checked our checklist. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? God has always demanded the best from His people. And while we no longer offer the best of our flocks or grain offerings or any other type of, of physical sacrifices like they did in the Old Testament. God still demands that sacrifices be made. That's part of what our, our bulletin article is on this morning. That we offer sacrifices to the Lord, but those sacrifices, again, aren't just to check checklists. It's to give Him our best. And not just on Sunday, and not just on Wednesday night, but every day. And the only way we're going to do that is by remembering the words of James. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. We offer an invitation this morning to those who are not Christians. That you have an opportunity this morning to be baptized, have your sins washed away, be added to the body of Christ, and then take on the responsibility, but also the privilege of being a child of God. For those of us who are Christians, we are all guilty at some point of kind of forgetting ourselves from time to time. Of not being as aware as we should be. But if we want to make it to heaven, and if we want to improve as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, then we have to start, not tomorrow morning, start five minutes from now. Start now. To make sure you're doing everything you can to be a proper servant of God. And if you need help, if you need encouragement, your brothers and your sisters in Christ are here for you. We want to help you. Because we love you and we all love God. Will you come forward as we stand and sing?